Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us here this afternoon. My name is Tyler Wilson, and I'm a program coordinator at the William & Mary Washington Center. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to this William & Mary Writers of Washington webinar focused on military service leadership through the lens of retired U.S. Marine Corps General Anthony Zinni's personal experience and books. Uh, this event is part of the Washington Center's 20th anniversary and a partnership event with Bob Merkel from the President's Office, the Association of 1775, the Office of Student Veteran Engagement, and Whole of Government Center of Excellence, and many more. Uh, my colleague Elizabeth Merrifield will place all the websites in the chat after this intro. Um, but for the past six months, the Center has hosted numerous virtual events and released monthly themed webinars. Um, and videos for our 20th anniversary celebration. Um, and we just wanted to thank you for joining us today for this event. Um, and we hope to offer more content for the whole William & Mary community until our 20th anniversary year ends at the end of 2021. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Washington Center is intended to be a small campus in the city for students and alumni alike. We offer what we call study in DC opportunities for undergrad students. Um, students can spend a week or up to an entire semester living and interning in DC while earning academic credits. Alumni mentors, speakers, and supervisors are the heart of these programs. Um, and if you'd like to engage with our students, we'd love to have you. We'll place that link in the chat here soon as well. Um, but today, we are thrilled to be joined here by retired U.S. Marine Corps General Anthony Zinni. Um, General Zinni served in the U.S. Marine Corps for 39 years and served as the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Central Command during his final tour. Since retiring, General Zinni has served in many diplomatic roles. Moderating this event will be Michael Dick, a retired U.S. Marine Corps Colonel, and William & Mary Visiting Professor of the Practice at the William & Mary Law School. Um, General Zinni is the author of three books with Tony Colts, uh, Leading the Charge, Leadership Lessons from the, from the Battlefield to the Boardroom, and The Battle for Peace, A Frontline Vision of America's Power and Purpose, uh, Before the First Shots Are Fired, How America Can Win or Lose Off the Battlefield. Um, General Zinni has also written books with Tom Clancy, the Battle Ready Commander series, and has written a foreword for Boys of 67 by Charles Jones. Before I hand this over to Michael Dick to start this discussion, I want to mention that any questions you have can be placed in the Q&A section of this webinar. Please feel free to type them out there, um, and if we have time, we will try our best to get to them. With that noted, Michael and General, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tyler, for that introduction, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I guess we're just past noon hour. And welcome to General Zinni for this uh, presentation as well. Uh, as mentioned, I am at the Polar Center, the Veterans Benefit Center at the William and Mary Law School. And I'll put in, first of all, a shameless plug for the uh, Veterans Center and call that to your attention. And General, as a vet veteran yourself, I think uh, you'd appreciate that. But I'd like to elaborate just, to, just for a moment on, on General, Zin General Zinni's extremely impressive background. There's a couple of things about it that I think really go to uh, help frame the general's perceptions or his uh, experiences. And it goes back actually, I think, uh, to his father who immigrated to the United States from Italy before World War I and was quickly drafted into the United States Army and, and fought during World War I. He had cousins that fought in World War II and a brother that fought in Korea. And of course, General Zinni has uh, experienced two tours in Vietnam, the second of which, during the second of which he was wounded in combat and has had numerous experiences as a commander at all levels, including up to a combatant commander, the commander of the U.S. Central Command, as Tyler mentioned. General Zinni is a very proud graduate of Villanova University, and he has received two master's degrees subsequent to that, but maybe most impressively, uh, extremely impressively, uh, just in 2020, he had earned a PhD um, and he, his dissertation examined military leadership and organizational innovation in the Pacific theater in World War II. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, the general served at, as a leader at uh, various military units and, and that U.S. Central Command and the expanse, the scope and the scale of that organization is just absolutely incredible. But piling on that, 
his experiences as a diplomatic uh, interlocutor around the world has an, a number of non-military uh, peace mediation efforts is particularly impressive as well. And we and certainly hope the general can uh, address some of those, those things. But today as one of the books that General Zinni wrote, the leading the charge, I would commend that to your attention. It is uh, a great um, uh, collection of thoughts and insights about what it takes to run organizations and, and how to uh, develop leaders. And with that, General, the first question I have for you, really starting with the basics, is how do you define leadership? What do you look for in, when you assess whether or not someone ought to be moved to a position of leadership? Well, first, thank you, Mike. Uh, I think my mother wrote that introduction uh, for you. Uh, leadership, in, in its simplest form, leadership is getting others to do what you want them to do. But obviously, there's more to it when we think about the kinds of leaders we want and the quality of leaders. Uh, you want to accomplish the mission and, and purpose of the organization. Uh, I think it's important that the things that you do are done in a moral and ethical and obviously legal way. Uh, it should be done in a way where the organization and, and the members of the organization feel proud of what they do, feel fulfilled of what they do, feel a sense of accomplishment. And I think that all falls to the leader in, in a definition of leadership. I also think it's important for the leader to set the vision uh, and the strategy and the direction for the organization too. And that's critical uh, because I think everyone wants to succeed and wants to be part of something special, but certainly wants to know where the organization is going. And so it, it falls to the leader to be a good communicator, a visionary, and someone that is capable of bringing an organization to a point in the future that is much greater than what it is now. Thank you, sir. Um, in your dissertation, you talk about the innovative leadership that, that evolved during the course of the Pacific War. Uh, and one of the key aspects of, a, of these innovative leaders is that they were able to draw insightful observations that others did not see. How do you cultivate that, that characteristic in people and, and your subordinates that you are growing to be future leaders? Yes, I, I, no, I particularly was impressed with the fact that in the Pacific theater in World War II, the commanders there, the MacArthur's and the Nimitz and the uh, LeMay's, uh, Stillwell, uh, Stillwell and others, we're faced with an entirely new form, entirely new forms of warfare. No one had ever fought carrier battles before. Uh, the first naval battles, the fleets didn't even see each other. Uh, amphibious operations were never conducted on a scale like that before. As a matter of fact, after Gallipoli and World War I, they were written off. And a whole series of technical innovations the, the requirements of the, uh, the nature of that conflict in the Pacific, the tyranny of distance, meant that none of those senior leaders were coming there with past experience that would allow them to apply it directly to what they were facing. Each one of them had a unique history, but there was some common ground. Uh, they tended to be outside the box thinkers, sort of recognized a little bit as maybe mavericks, uh, I was impressed with the fact that they determined what the environment was that they were in in a different way than everybody else did. To give you an example, when Nimitz first arrived at Pearl Harbor, obviously after the attack and his predecessor had been relieved and the commanders were showing him around and they felt that, uh, oh, woe is me, look at this damage, uh, Admiral, look at the battleship row, this is tragic. And Nimitz's first comment was the Japanese has screwed up. Uh, they didn't bomb the uh, fuel storage areas. They didn't bomb the maintenance facilities. In other words, the whole function of the base was still intact. And so the other commanders got focused on the negative side and the damage, which is understandable. His mind, he was able to see something different, a positive side. Uh, he was rebuilding at Pearl Harbor as, as our primary base in the Pacific in his mind when he just arrived. And I could say the same thing for MacArthur. You know, he's extracted from Corregidor. 
Uh, he has to leave his command there, which was tremendously emotional for him. He arrives in Australia. They establish a command for him, Southwest Pacific Command. There's no forces in there. The Australians decide to uh, provide their forces what they have left. Most of their quality forces are fighting in Africa and in Europe. And they put the, the Australian forces basically reserves and what we would consider like National Guard under MacArthur. So he doesn't really have a viable command. They're still fighting you know, going on in New Guinea. And immediately he starts building a plan to retake the Philippines and invade Japan. Uh, you know, and everybody's looking at him. Are you crazy? I mean, we should just be thinking about survival at this point and building a base. He is already projecting uh, power in his mind and what it will take uh, to actually win the war. And the same thing for like General LeMay and the other generals that were involved in then the Army Air Corps to become the Air Force in this whole new business of strategic bombing. And it was a matter of how to conduct this, how to uh, stretch out uh, the short ranges of the initial bombers until the B-29 came on. We see Doolittle's raid, you know, we have B-25s coming off carriers, which is unheard of. Uh, we see uh, uh, Stillwell in the Burma, China, India theater and creative organizations like Merle's Marauders. I looked at 42 innovations out there for my dissertation and studied them from the very tactical level, from the idea of employing Navajo Indians as code talkers for security, uh, all the way up to the development of a strategic bomber and uh, the carrier operations and, and these sorts of things. And it, it was amazing because the selection of the commanders out there was done carefully by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is Marshall and Hap Arnold and er Ernest King, who's the Chief of Naval Operations. And they were, immediately identified as different kinds of thinkers, as maybe mavericks, as I said before, and people who saw things in a different light and had a vision that went beyond what everybody else's might have been at that point. And that ended up washing down through the commands where young officers then and, and, and NCOs and others caught this sort of fever of innovation and creating ideas and being able to organize to implement the ideas. And I thought the Pacific Command was an interesting study, primarily because it was done under stress. It was done in the middle of a war. There had been a lot written about innovation and this kind of thinking in interwar periods. We took the lessons of the last war to apply it to the next war. But this was a case where so many innovations and creative leadership was located in one very unique theater. And, and that is uh, particularly striking. I totally agree. Those folks that you mentioned, sir, were very clearly very much students of their profession. They studied uh, the lessons of the previous uh, war and a previous century, um, but they came to con uh, different conclusions about the way going forward because many times the military leaders will as folks know, will fight the last war, prepare to fight the last war. Because, you know, in, in, in Vietnam, the strategic bombing campaign uh, was not the uh, effective tool that it had been in World War II because the enemy was different, but we never, we never caught that, I think. Um, but as a student of history, do any uh, books stand out today? What are you reading today that, that applies to this topic? Well, uh, I would like to suggest some books on leadership uh, that do include historical references and others. Uh, probably the best book on leadership I found was called Leadership, so it's not hard to remember. It was written by uh, Peter uh, Northhouse, uh, N-O-R-T-H-O-U-S-E. Now, Northhouse's books, he's on the eighth edition. These are often used as texts. Uh, this is a, a tremendous reference book. It's not the kind of book you're going to sit down and, you know, in a nice cozy chair by a fire and read. It's the kind, it's the kind that you're going to constantly go back to the table of contents, look up things and read about it because he's captured leadership theory and, and all the elements of leadership in, in one book. And it, he keeps updating it because within the last, I'd say, 15 to 20 years, there's been a lot of studies and a lot of writing done 
on leadership theory. And it's really been evolving and it's really been changing. And there's nothing in our history that's comparable to this period that is so much focused on, on leadership. The other book I would re uh, recommend or series of books was written by a decision psychologist called Gary Klein, K-L-E-I-N. Gary, uh, and I know Gary very well, and we work with him in the Marine Corps. He has done a whole set of studies on decision-making, particularly looking at policemen, firemen, and military personnel and making decisions under stress. I think by last count, he had about nine books out and defined the different kinds of decision-making and uh, you know, recognitional decision-making, intuitive decision-making, uh, how uh, individual leaders go through a decision-making process. And I would say those are, those are two sources uh, that I think are worth looking at and, and, and to get a good handle and understanding about leadership. Uh, and I think it's important to read books like this first. So when you go into, say, history books, and you're looking at leadership, particularly in the course of history and different events, you, can, you have a background in understanding leadership theory uh, and understanding how decisions are made and how strategies are developed so that you can draw out from those history books and as you look to the individual leaders as to how they did it or why they did it. It just makes you more aware than uh, when you do that historical examination. But thank you, sir. I was going to have that question at the end, but uh, I couldn't resist. I just had to move to it because I'd like to read as well. Uh, turn back to your dissertation. One of the things you, you mentioned in there about the commanders that was a, a unique aspect in the, well, an important aspect is that they gave their subordinates great operational freedom and they were ex uh, willing to accept risk and uncertainty and failure in the Pacific. You know, in today's, uh, you know, zero tolerance climate in many, uh, you know, industries, including the military, uh, that's a very hard place to get to. How do you, how do you overcome that? How do you break through that? If you're working for a, a, a person who uh, really is not, is risk averse and not willing to uh, delegate. I, I think there's two questions there. And one has to do with zero defects mentality where uh, we will not accept uh, a mistake or an error. Obviously, there are some mistakes that might be made or errors in judgment that might be made that are so great, it's difficult to recover. Uh, but I would point out, Nimitz ran a ship aground. Now, how do you make five-star admiral if you've run a ship aground? It's unheard of today. MacArthur, you know, failed when they had the warning on the Philippines that the attack was imminent to disperse his airplanes and prepare for it. You know, yet he's a five-star general you know, leading, the, and he would have been command of everything in the Pacific for the invasion of Japan had it happened. There was actually discussion of getting him a six-star uh, to be able to do that. And of course the atomic bombs uh, made that a moot point. Uh, it, you know, so what you see in, in, in these leaders, it, it, it reminds me of Teddy Roosevelt's speech that he gave it to Sorbonne about the man in the arena. And I would, I would you know, ask that you look that up, the, the man in the arena speech by Teddy Roosevelt. Basically, the gist of it is the man in the arena, in the arena is going to get beaten at times. He's going to be dusty and dirty, but he's going to get up and fight and fight again and uh, honor the fact that he goes into the arena. He gains those experiences and he's willing to accept, uh, you know, sometimes a, a defeat because he is able to learn from it. He has the, the courage and, and the will uh, to keep trying. And I think going back to those uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff at that time, the Marshals and the Arnolds and the, and, and the Kings, this is what they wanted in their commanders. And they specifically chose those commanders in the most difficult theater of operation, I think, you know, arguably in the Pacific in World War II, uh, because they and, and they knew that's what they needed out there. In addition, those commanders chose their subordinate commanders with the same judgment. There are, there are cases out there where there are fleet commanders that have a problem with uh, drinking. There are, there's issues out there where uh, they make horrible mistakes but come back again. Uh, you know, it, it, they're able to judge the individual 
appreciate the fact that, yes, there's going to be mistakes made. We're all new at this game. Uh, but if I think that this individual is learning from their mistakes and they have the wherewithal, uh, wherewithal to do it, I'm going to accept that and, and, and continue to have trust in them. And it paid off across the board. Uh, the, the ones that sort of were pushed aside out there were what I call the traditionalists that, that did not, were not capable of thinking differently. They, they, and they were overly cautious. Nimitz and MacArthur and Stilwell and LeMay and, and, and the Joint Chiefs pushed those people aside. Sometimes gently, they gave them a, an innocuous command somewhere uh, else. But it, you can see that they went down and they dug for that type of commander all the way down. And, it, and when you begin to see uh, aviators in a squadron, young captains and lieutenants or ensigns and uh, lieutenants designing new formations and how they would fight, uh, you know, and this washed down in every one of the services out there, creating new organizations on the spot. Uh, you know, the, the UDT, underwater demolitions teams created uh, by Admiral Kelly uh, 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 and, and uh, Admiral Spruance uh, uh, to be able to uh, get better beach reconnaissance. The, the uh, coastal uh, watches uh, that, that provided information that were made up of Americans, Australians, British, and, and, and New Zealanders out there, uh, the Navajo code talkers. Uh, you know, it, it's amazing the ability to accept innovative ideas that might be brushed aside uh, easily. Uh, I would use that Navajo, just a, just a short story of, of how that came about. There was a Marine two-star general in the West Coast of the United States that was relegated to just training the troops and getting them ready to go out, out to the Pacific as replacements and other things. So General Vogel, he was sitting there in his office and uh, Southern California, and in walks this man who says, uh, General, uh, my name is Johnson. I'm the son of a missionary. Where I grew up on Navajo reservations. I know you have a problem with uh, security at the tactical level on your radios. They didn't have any encryption devices in those days. He said, the Navajos have a unique language. There's only six white men that can speak the language, and none of them are fluent. It's not a written language at all. And he says, I think you could use the Navajos and it, it is a language that, that none of our enemies would be able to break. And he was intrigued by the idea. And he asked Johnson if he could get together a group of Navajos willing to you know, think this through, prepare a dictionary, be able to train as operators. And the first requirement is all of them would have to be Marines first. So they brought them through boot camp. They made them Marines. He made... Johnson, a staff sergeant, they built a dictionary, they recruited more Navajos and built this sort of automatic encryption through the language of the Navajos, who, by the way, the Navajos had the largest per capita ethnic participation in World War II, more than any other ethnic group. Wow. Wow. That's, that's impressive. Yes, sir. I was was where they uh, code talkers, but not uh, of that uh, level of participation. And that willingness to accept that kind of a new innovation there, it, it goes to the question of organizational change. Organizations are inherently uh, you know, stuck where they are today. Change is, uh, is, is usually uh, disruptive. It's uh, somebody gets their ox gored. Uh, so organizations are historically resistant to change. How do you inculcate a mindset in an organization as a leader, inculcate a mindset in an organization that makes it willing to embrace change, to look for change, to uh, encourage change? How, how do you get that amongst your leaders? I, I, you know, you're bringing up two important points. I, when I did my dissertation and when I taught leadership at the Sanford Center at, at Duke and when I, when I wrote the book and, and all the other things that I got involved in afterward, I did a lot of research on what I would call 21st century leadership. I didn't want any of this to be my experience as that I'm just brushing forward because I thought times change, situations change, the, the nature of how we lead and uh, the complexity of how, uh, what we're faced with is very different. And I did find that to be true. Uh, one of the things, that, of the two things I would bring up that you have addressed here, 
is organization. Organizations now are not the traditional block and wire diagram that we're used to, we grew up with, and, you know, boss at the top, solid line, two more people than, you know, looks like a Christmas tree. Those organizations die. They're too uh, heavy. They're too awkward. They're too time consuming in decision making. People now think in terms of web designs, flattened organizations, uh, matrix uh, designs, uh, and there's all sorts of crazy ways uh, that uh, uh, people think about flexible organizations to make them more relevant, more speedy in their decision making and execution. But they're hard to uh, implement sometimes because you know you have people that don't like change, and this is the second part. And and in, in my book, I wrote about change, uh, leading change, and leading crisis, and leading in conflict all in the same line, in the same chapter, if you will, because the things you're confronted with are the same in each of these. Change and crisis and conflict create the same kind of internal upheaval. Uh, and then you get into really examining the kind of organization you're leading because you will have traditionalists that don't like change. You're gonna have people in the organization that said, look, I've been here for 25 years, you know, why are we changing it? I'm not comfortable with this. You're going to have somebody that just walked in the door last Thursday saying, I love it. You know, let's go for it. You know, I'm, I'm 22 and I'm, I'm open to anything, uh, which is another issue about leading diversity. And the most difficult part of diversity to lead is generational diversity in the workforce, more so than uh, the other things when we traditionally think of diversity. Uh, leading diversity is another 21st century requirement that is much greater than we've ever faced before. But, you know, the idea that the organ, the, you master the organization, the organization doesn't master you. And to build a culture in the organization, willing to change, willing to be flexible. Uh, and along with that comes a lot of issues of accountability and responsibility and, you know, setting the right processes. If you're if you're changing to meet the requirements of the environment or the industry or the mission of the, your military unit or whatever, uh, you have to build a different mindset and culture in, in your people uh, to be ready to deal with that because it can be upsetting in many ways. Hey, yes, sir. I totally agree with that. And you touched on the generational change, the requirement for generational change. Uh, that seems to be creating a lot of stress uh, in the United States uh, today as the population demographics change and the age of the, the include racial and ethnic and generate and age uh, characteristics change. But in an organization, uh, you know, to break out of that inertia, how, how do you get um, folks who have been in that organization for 30 years to understand that you know, there, it, it is time to have a new way of doing things and, and getting them on board to, to accept the new way of thinking. You talked about web design and new ways of doing things as opposed to the historical wire diagram, a flattened structure. Uh, folks just sometimes, and I think in your book, Leading the Charge, you talk about it um, in several places where executives come into you and have talked to you about, they just cannot deal with it. And as a consequence, the organization is stymied. How, how, is there any uh, key? Is there, are there any leadership characteristics um, that will help you get through that? And particularly, I'm, I'm thinking about the relationship between the leaders and the led and how that um, is bridged in times of dynamic change that require dynamic change. I think that there's a couple ways to do it. One is to bring in maybe, and, and I'll use the broad term I used before, traditionalists that may be more resistant, to bring them into the process of change. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're going to create a team that looks at change and looks at how uh, we may uh, build a different kind of organization, bring them into the process uh, and, and make sure they understand you know, clearly why this is happening, what needs to be accomplished. I would say one thing, and this is the lesson I learned from my research, you, you know, and I'll go back to the Pacific again, uh, people like MacArthur and like Nimitz and all, 
they didn't tolerate resistors very long. You know, uh, if, if you were in the way of progress, they gave you a chance to adapt and adjust and, you know, understand the need. And I think a lot of cases were very patient, but they weren't going, you, you weren't going to sit there being an obstacle or an obstruction very long. And they moved you out very quickly. Uh, and so I think you have to look at the direction you're going, the requirement for the change, give everybody an opportunity to accept it, to understand it, to participate in the change. But if you meet that kind of resistance and it jeopardizes what you're trying to accomplish, the vision and the need or whatever is generating this, I think you have to uh, move them aside. Uh, you find the same thing when you're faced with a crisis. Uh, I did a lot of uh, studies on uh, crisis, like the uh, BP oil spill in, in, in uh, uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico. And, and Mike, you'll probably remember one that was a classic. It was uh, uh, back in the 50s when a Marine drill instructor on a Sunday after having a few drinks marched his platoon into the swamps and I think five or six recruits drowned. And it brought the whole recruit training thing under uh, a microscope and obviously change need to be made in some ways without losing, you know, what the purpose of the training was. Uh, it was under fire from Congress and everywhere else. And there were many resistors. And finally, one young uh, brigadier general who probably wasn't going anywhere, didn't have a tremendous combat record, saved the Marine Corps. And his name was uh, Wallace M. Green. He became the commandant later on. He was able to preserve everything that the recruit training needed to do, but he improved the supervision and, and all the other things that allowed it to happen within a much clearer, safer, uh, well-supervised and well-led environment. Uh, and he was the only one that, that could bridge the gap from, yeah, we have to preserve some, some things, but we have to make some realistic changes in order to make that preservation uh, a fact. So, you know, in crisis and in, in change, there's always leaders that pop out to the top. Sometimes leaders you didn't expect. Remember, you know, mavericks in the normal day-to-day -day stuff tend to be outliers. When there's something dynamic going on, like change or crisis or in the midst of a conflict, the mavericks oftentimes tend to pop to the top or demonstrates uh, skills and, and a set of uh, ways of thinking that no one else has. And end up becoming you know the, the the leaders that that you end up seeing then uh, later on in the future at the top end of the organization yes sir the ability to adapt has been shown to be uh, absolutely crucial to progress uh, in that regard though how about strategic vision the development of strategic vision and leaders you, you start with young leaders and you one thing that is clear from your book and and from certainly my experience is you've got to know your profession. You have to master your profession, whatever it is, you have to be very, very good at it. Uh, and that's the tactical level, if you will, at least for the start, then developing that longer range view, that strategic vision. How do you develop that in, uh, in leaders? You know, one, you of the things I, one of the things I did after I retired is I did, and this was purely by accident, and I fell into doing consulting work for organizations that wanted to build leader programs, leader development programs. Uh, and in, in my mind, much like the military thinks in tactical, operational, strategic levels, in the, in the business world, there's entry level, mid-level, and executive level. And I found that you know, it, they match up clearly. There, there is a, a level of leadership training, education, experiences at that initial level. Then there's a level of that training and education and experience at the mid-level. Then there's at the top level. And you, you begin to realize you, at the beginning, you're making tactical decisions. You move up and it's more operational. You're beginning to put many pieces together. Uh, and then at the strategic level where uh, you're required to have a vision and the foresight, uh, look into the future and design uh, um, um, a way to get the organization to that vision. The most difficult part of that I found is when I would work with CEOs and uh, leaders of different organizations is getting them to articulate a vision. 
you know, what, what happens is the current environment that we're in now, whether it's military, whether it's uh, corporate world, business, whatever, it is so complex. It is such a heated environment. We're reduced to being transactional leaders. You know, what I, what I would see out there, uh, they couldn't see past the next quarter. Uh, I got to make my numbers for the next quarter, the next report to the board. The, you know, uh, th- th- did I make my plan numbers for this quarter? And it, was dr- it drives organizations down to being transactional, tactical, if you will. Uh, getting them back up out of that, making them look ahead. In the military, we tend to look strategically out 15, 20 years. Uh, in, in the business world, it's more like three to five years for a lot of different reasons. But to be, even be able to say something that is a visionary statement. Most CEOs you sit down with, if you try to push them on this, they give you numbers. They say, well, I want to become a $20 billion uh, company in five years, or I want an EBITDA you know, earnings uh, or margin at this. It, you got to tell them, get away from the numbers. Tell me a story. Tell me, describe this organization to me in a story form five years from now and what it's going to be. And, and, you know, and, and they get to you know, platitudes and Oh, we're going to be the finest widget makers in the, in the industry or something. I don't want to hear that. What does that mean? You know, get, because your, your organization has to build goals and objectives and action plans and resource allocations and all that uh, in, in a viable strategic plan to get there. So you have to be able to, to give them a vision that they can draw out what they need to do, goals and, and objectives, how they need to do it. And what it's going to take to do it, you know, in, in terms of action plans and, and, and resource allocation. It's a very complicated process. Uh, it takes a while, especially if there's no experience in that. Harvard has done studies that says that top leaders, CEO, general officers, whatever, less than 4% are strategic in their thinking and in their actions and their development. I've seen other studies that have gone as high as 9%. I have yet to see a study that went into double digits on senior leaders. Wow. How, how did we get a George Marshall? And where do we get the next one? How do we, how do we get the next vision? That, that was the thing. I know you've, you've said this before that, you know, we went 50 years saying, hey, we're going to win. We're going to outlast the Russians. We're going to beat, you know, the, the Soviets. We're going to, uh, you know, emerge into the sunshine at the end of this, uh, at some point in the future. Then it happened and there were no big thinkers around to, they hadn't, they did not have a plan for what happens when we win, what happens when we're there. Where do we get the next George Marshall? Well, you know, it, it, it's an interesting contrast between the end of World War II and the end of the Cold War. During World War II, we had tremendous strategic thinkers. The number one thinker was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who just few days after Pearl Harbor, calls in Marshall and the senior generals and says, we need a strategy. And he says, I'm going to start giving you the, the tenets of the strategy. We will become the arsenal of democracy, meaning I'm going to go to my strength, our industrial base. I'm going to outproduce the enemy and I'm going to arm all our allies. Uh, at the height of our uh, production, we were producing more tanks in a month than Germany at the height of their production could produce in a year. We built something like 90 carriers in three and a half years. Some of them were the small carriers and all. Uh, some of them were the fleet carriers. But, you know, so he started at his level. As, you know, he, he, he worked with the, the British. He built the combined chiefs of staff. He began the coordination. So he was looking at how we would develop an allied strategy for this. He gave some direction. It was Europe first uh, until he realized in the Pacific they could actually hold ground. So you see the beginnings of a strategic dialogue. He tells Marshall to to connect to the British, form the combined Joint Joint Chiefs of Staff, build a military strategy uh, for me. And of course, the the chiefs are about doing this in both the Pacific uh, and and Europe. Uh, Immediately when the war ended, the period, say from 1944 to 1950, think about these things. The United States leads in creating the United Nations, NATO, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. We go to Bretton Woods and we begin to 
uh, stabilize uh, international currency and, and tag it. Uh, we, we enact the 1947 National Security Act, which redesigns our, our, our uh, defense organization. Uh, and I could go on and on. And, and we establish, because we see the Cold War coming, uh, a, a strategy of deterrence and containment. Kennan and Marshall and others are the architects of this. We rebuild Europe, the Marshall Plan, which had less than 19% popular support. Marshall gave 80 some speeches to encourage the Amer American public to support this. And think about this, Harry Truman is a Democrat in the administration. Both the Congress, both houses of Congress are Republican. And the leader of the Republicans is Vandenberg. And, Van, and they were arch enemies. I mean, it was even more heated than you see today. But for the good of the nation, they worked together on each of these and produced it. Now, fast forward to the end of the Cold War, when we had uh, President Bush and Gorbachev talking about a new world order and a peace dividend. And this is all, we're going to have all this change. What happened? Did we see this flurry of reorganization of international organizations being formed, realignment of uh, alliances. We saw none of this uh, strategic uh, uh, thinking and action. And, and I don't necessarily blame the president. You know, we had lost it along the way uh, and we, we never recovered it. You know, President Bush got pressed on this and he said, uh, oh, you mean the vision thing? Like, don't bother me with it. President Obama, when he was pushed on it, said, uh, I don't need any Kennans. So, I mean, you know, we saw presidents from the end of the Cold War to probably right now, you know, we have entered into conflicts without strategy. We entered to a, into Iraq and Afghanistan with no strategy. I mean, if you went into a coma right after 9-11 and you woke up today and you asked what happened, you would not believe how we ended up trying to nation build in Afghanistan went into Iraq, why? You know, Iraq, were they responsible for 9-11? Hell no, uh, the, you know, the uh, Al-Qaeda is the arch enemy of Saddam. You know, I mean, you look at all the things that happened, there was no strategy to frame it, to keep you on track. Then you get mission creep, you lapse into, uh, uh, for lack of strategy, into things that you never signed up to to begin with, like rebuilding a country from scratch and, you have no plan or design for it. So you, I would say this is one of the biggest factors. It's one of my eight biggest factors and some of which we've talked about here that, that I think are important for leaders today. And that's the ability to think and act strategically. Yes, sir. At the end of World War II, we pretty much faced a bipolar world. It was us versus them. Today, of course, it is uh, multi polar and cultures that we have no ability to understand or no experience with or emerging as significant, at least regional players that have an effect, uh, an impact on the U.S. economy and uh, diplomatic and political issues. Is the world just too complicated for our leaders and, and our structure too complex to be able to adapt to that? I would frame it this way. It's too complicated and too complex for the kind of leadership thinking we've had in the past, with exceptions like the period I mentioned. This invite, let's just take China, for example. If I were to ask you, is China a partner, a competitor, or an adversary? The answer is yes, all three. So now, if you're a leader, you have to function in each of those dimensions. I'm partnering with China, maybe on climate change and so, or something else. I'm competing economically. I'm going to challenge them as an adversary in the South China Sea with freedom of navigation uh, operations and other things. That is a complex strategic design. And you're gonna have people that aren't that sophisticated that are gonna challenge you and say, wait a minute, China's the enemy. No, China's a friend. Oh, China's somewhere in between. And we should, the answer is yes to all of it. And so managing in a complex environment is extremely difficult because uh, you face on a given day, you're operating in one of those dimensions. 
And you can't forget the other dimensions. And you can't let one of those dimensions dominate. You know, we can't let an adversarial relationship lead us into a Cold War. We can't believe that they're kumbaya, great partners, and then not see the challenges of competition and, and maybe adversarial relationships. So it requires a thinker that's much more sophisticated, understands and can operate in a, a complex environment and, and a dynamic environment. That uh, reminds me of that old saying, what you see depends on where you sit. And some folks uh, just cannot see from that direction, um, you know, the big picture. But at any rate, sir, thank you very much for that. We've got some questions, I think, coming into uh, the Q&A. We'll look at that and want to encourage anyone who has questions to go ahead and please to put them in the Q&A. And the first question we've got here is, uh, and I'll read it to you, sir. Um, there is a lot of cynicism and disillusionment in the veteran community related to the Afghanistan withdrawal. I am curious to hear General Denny's thoughts regarding what we can do to ensure that we are not bogged down in further military actions without a clear vision of what the vital national security interests for the action are. How do we ensure that leaders do not give the powell Weinberger doctrine short shrift? It seems that there's a lot of momentum for positive institutional change, and I am wondering what General Zinni sees as the way forward. Sure. Yeah, well, first of all, and this kind of tags on to this last discussion, we have a disconnect between the military, uniform military, and the civilian leadership in, the, in that we in the military have devised this elaborate, complex military planning system. It relies on somebody above us civilian leadership, providing us the strategy, the political objectives, you know, what FDR and Truman were giving to Marshall, we don't get anymore. So when we go on to a battlefield, uh, you know, we are, we are out there groping for what we're supposed to do, especially if things don't turn out quite well. Al Qaeda beats feet to Pakistan and you're sitting in Afghanistan, then what? You know, and if you can't answer the then what question, because there is no strategy, we do something terrible that I blame generals for, you know, my peers. We create a strategy. We create a coin, counterinsurgency. We're, you know, here we are stuck in Afghanistan. The reason we came was to get Al Qaeda there gone. Well, let's just stay here and take this ninth century society and build it into a Jeffersonian democracy and a free market economy. No idea what the cost is going to be, no idea what the casualties and you know, the, the political uh, international relations situation is, is going to require, and we get stuck that way. We should have learned this lesson in Vietnam. We should have learned this lesson in Somalia. We should have learned this lesson in Iraq. We should have learned this lesson in, in Afghanistan. You know, if you go back to the Gulf War, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, you did see a strategy. And, and to the credit of the Bush administration, uh, to James Baker, to Brent Scowcroft, uh, to Colin Powell, who was the chairman, and Cheney, the Secretary of Defense, they immediately set the strategic guidelines. We were not going to Baghdad. You know, it, it, if at all possible, we are, going to, we are going to go to the United Nations, make this under the authority of the United Nations, which is a tremendous asset because it, it allows you to collect allies. Uh, it gives you credibility. We will defeat the forces in Kuwait and kick them out. We will contain Iraq, but we're not going to make it to 51st state. You could argue with that if you want to, but it was a strategy. And so the containment for those years up until we decided to invade it, we did it with less troops and report to the Pentagon every day. And we did it in an environment where uh, training it was positive, where you know, in Kuwait, we could fire all our weapon systems. I mean, the, the Army and Marine troops are up there telling me this was equivalent to 29 Palms and the NTA and what they could do. Uh, our special forces were able to train out, our special operations force trained well. Our pilots had a little different set. Flying the no-fly zones is not a lot of skill training. So we rotated them much quicker so that they wouldn't lose proficiency. They could still maintain that. We ended up it, 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 throughout that in, in getting control of the Kurdish area. Saddam could not go in there. 
aiding and helping the Marsh Arabs and, and, and the Shia because of the no-fly zones so that, that they could resist Saddam. And when he resisted the UN inspectors because President Clinton gave us the authority to target anything we, we felt we needed to as a punishment for not obeying, we took down his entire air defense system. All this in, within containment without going to Baghdad and now making it another star on the flag, you know, and trying to get into nation building. And we forgot all that. And we decided to go blundering in because we had some leaders who thought we're all gonna be received with, remember flowers in the streets, Kumbaya and, and Baghdad? Yeah, big surprise. In the 2003 invasion, that the, the lead up after we got our, I took our eyes off the ball in Afghanistan to, and pivoted to Iraq. Is that what you're you're talking about, sir? Yeah, and 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 the worst of all situations, your your causes belli, weapons of mass destruction, which everybody that's I was a combatant commander, CENTCOM, right up to 2000. Uh, at, at the end of 2000, there was no weapons of mass destruction. All of us knew that. The inspectors knew that. And by the way, the inspection teams were our intelligence officers and guys that we had in there that were junkyard dogs and the way they went after that. And they were telling us there are no weapons of mass destruction. We just were looking for an excuse to go in. And uh, we end up, when, when, you're, when you're discredited by the action that you use to justify it, you'll never overcome that. Remember Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin incident? that later proved to be phony. And, and, and that discrediting damages your, your, your whole sense of moral right, justification, you know, legal uh, uh, position on, and, and, and in many ways with our allies creates a credibility, excuse me, a credibility gap because they accept it as being truth and join up with us. I think uh, Tony Blair to this day regrets you know, having uh, joined up with us. Yes, sir. That, that uh, you know, uh, brings me back or brings up the, uh, the thought of H.R. Uh, McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty, yep. where he says uh, and discusses how political leadership of the United States and military leadership as well lied to the American people, he felt, about what was going on in Vietnam and the progress that was not being made. And of course, that as a, you know, very clear that we did not learn that lesson, uh, it appears, and what much of it was repeated in Afghanistan. So that, that goes to the question of how do you, you know, when you're in that kind of an environment, a toxic, in many ways, a toxic environment, a toxic leadership environment. I mean, in October of 2019, the president, through a tweet, announced that we were withdrawing, um, you know, our advisors in Syria you know, and deserting the Kurds. And the impact then was to push the Kurds into the, the Russian and Iranian camp. How do you deal with that? It's a military leader, that situation. Or, or uh, you know, it's not quite clear yet what's happened with regards to military leadership. I think it's for military recommendations with, with regards to uh, Afghanistan and the withdrawal there and how that came about um, and what the recommendations were. But clearly it became... Uh, I mean, you've been involved and studied NEOs. They're never pretty. They're always messy. Uh, but that one in particular seemed to be uh, pretty challenging. You know, when I was a, a, a lieutenant, I was assigned as an advisor to Vietnamese Marines. I wore their uniform. I spoke their language. I went to uh, Vietnamese language school. I, you know, I, got, I was trained at Army Special Warfare School at Fort Bragg. Uh, the Vietnamese Marines were small unit. They operate all over the country. They were their most elite for force. Uh, and they had a quartering act. We moved into the villages and lived in the houses with the people. And I remember moving into this village and I moved into the village chief's house. And the village chief's wife, uh, older woman, very nice, fixed his food. And one evening she looked at me and she said, why are you here? And I said, well, you know, the United States is here to do, you know, I gave her the elevator speech on Jeffersonian democracy and free market economy. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, you know, we've been fighting for 30 years, Japanese, French, you know, now you're here. And she pointed, we were in uh, the middle of, of, of South Vietnam in, in Northern Tukor. She pointed South and she says, 
what about them? Am I supposed to die for them? And I said, I thought she's making a mistake. And I said, you, you, you mean North Hanoi? And I mean, you, we're, you know, when you, she said, are you going to fix that problem? She said, no. You see all those generals down there that one coup after another, big men, little men, Tiu, Ki, and I see your General Westmoreland standing right next to them and your government supporting them. So you're telling me and my son, I should die for that. She said, what, should, what do you want me to die for? And a couple of things hit me with that question. First of all, if she's asking me what she should die for, we've made a big mistake. If she doesn't have something to die for that she understands, it's a big mistake. If we have propped up corrupt and illegitimate governments that clearly can be seen by the people, we haven't given them anything like we did in Germany and Japan in the end of World War II to die for. You know, and the other thing that got me too, and this is the impact from Vietnamese Marines who would always remind me, you're gonna be here for a year. We're gonna be here forever. You know, we're gonna fight this war to one way or another. And they had sanctuary in North Vietnam. So that every time that, the, that you defeated, which is almost every battle, the enemy, they can go back and refit, rearm, re-recruit, and come back at you. I left with two things out of that little experience. There better be a damn good reason that you give them to die for, and you can't have a sanctuary where, where the enemy is immune. Fast forward to Afghanistan, corrupt government, you know, nothing to die for except you know, a myth that we built up that some poor young people, particularly girls, began to believe in. Uh, but obviously, the military wasn't ready to die for. And a sanctuary in Pakistan. I mean, we saw this movie before, and we didn't learn from it. Yes, sir. General, we're approaching the top of the hour, but we've got a couple questions. And we'll, if you have time, we'd run over, but uh, then wrap it up. And and basically, the two questions that I got are, are very similar. And, and basically, can you get you know other thinkers like General Keane and 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 Admiral Gaiman and to to you know help the administration work with the administration to create ideas for a real vision? And and, and what can uh, you know senior military leaders do when the uh, uh, political guidance that's coming out is just uh, something they can't, cannot live with. I mean, you saw where I think it was reported in Bob Woodward's most recent book, Peril, where the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was so concerned about potential, what he thought would be potential actions by the president of the United States that he called his Chinese counterpart to, to warn him off. I mean, General Mattis resigned over uh, some disagreements with the president. Is that the only thing you can do? Um, and with that, sir, if you could respond to that and any wrap up uh, comments that you might have, okay. we'll then uh, close the session down. You know, when I was a, the, the commander of U.S. Central Command, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff with General Hugh Shelton, a uh, special forces guy, and he was constantly, although I think he had a really good relationship with the Secretary of Defense and with the President, uh, and we all did at that time because Secretary Cohen wanted the President to know every one of us, so we had one-on-one -on -one time with the President during the year, several times during the year, Secretary Cohen made sure each of the combatant commanders and service chiefs had to sit down with the president where we told him you know, our thoughts and what we needed to, uh, to say. And he gets to know who we are. Uh, the other thing that they did is they said, if you, are, if you object to policy, some policy or some decision that was made, we will put you in front uh, of, of the leadership, either in Congress or the administration so that your voice is heard. I actually called them on that a couple of times and, and, it, and it happened. You don't necessarily win, but you got a voice on that. The other thing that, that General Shelton wanted, he, was, he wanted to have a four-star general or admiral in the National Security Council, only there for the purposes of saying, before you start thinking about what you're going to do, and it gets passed to Department of Defense and the military to execute, Make sure the military consideration and needs are in the beginning of the planning. In other words, if that four-star general there, who's also communicating to the chairman is saying, 
look, gentlemen, everybody around the table here has got suits and skirts or no uniforms. Uh, remember, they need political objectives. You need to understand what you want to have happen. You've got to articulate a vision of an end state here. The military needs that for their planning what to do or else they're making it up on the on the go. And that always leads to disaster. Uh, you, I'm glad you mentioned the Weinberger Doctrine and the Powell Doctrine. They spelled it out there, both, and, and we seem to ignore it uh, all the time. Uh, you know, to wrap it up, I, 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 when I looked at 21st century leadership, and we've covered a lot of this, I saw eight things that were critical. A leader has to really understand and know his or her environment. You better understand those people you're leading. They're much more diverse and complicated and well-educated than they ever have been in the past. And that makes leadership a challenge in many ways. They are formed by generations very differently. And so you really got to invest in understanding this complicated uh, group that, that you're leading and have an individual touch to them. There are three reasons a leader fails. It's either incompetence, poor conduct, personal conduct, or lack of caring for his people. So remember those three C's, you know, competence, conduct, and caring. Those are the three, one of those three is going to cause you to fail. Decision-making is problem solving. And you need to think, you need to know how to think critically. You have to be able to do credible analysis and synthesis to come up with the solution. You need to be a visionary and understand how to build a strategic design and plan for your organization. You need to understand that organization in detail and, and be able to shift it and move it and, and form it in different ways to meet the challenges you face. You must be an expert communicator. The, the communication links within your organization have to be solid. And as I said before, you've got to be able to lead an organization through change, crisis, and conflict. And I would close by saying the greatest leadership movie ever made was The Wizard of Oz. And the reason I say that, because the Tin Man wanted a heart, the Scarecrow wanted a brain, and the Lion wanted courage or guts. A brain to make good decisions, a heart to care for your people, and the guts to do the right thing. That's leadership. Thank you very much, Gerald. Great way to wrap it up. Uh, I'll turn it back to Elizabeth, Tyler, Bob, all yours. Well, um, I want to just come up and close out this event by saying thank you so much um, for joining us today, General Zinni, and sharing your knowledge. Um, I find history and military history so interesting. Um, as a daughter of a Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, it's always interesting to hear about that and to hear from all the different branches and to see how all this works. Um, I hope the audience enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. Um, and again, thank you so much, General Zinni. And Michael Dick, thank you so much for agreeing to moderate this discussion. Um, we were thrilled that you uh, agreed to join and you asked such great questions. And thank you so much for leading this discussion. It was great. And you had such great follow-up questions too. Um, for the audience, my name is Elizabeth Merrifield. As my colleague mentioned earlier, I'm the event and office coordinator at the William A. Washington Center. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and spending a little bit more than over an hour of your time with us this afternoon. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. And then for those who are watching the recording, thank you for taking your time out of your day to watch the recording. It means a lot to us. Um, and on that, um, on the behalf of the center and everyone who was a part of planning this event, I hope Thank you all again for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Look forward to crossing paths with you in the future, General. Okay.